Welcome to another edition of California Triathlon Soup. Today we have a very special guest. We have legendary uh, running cross-country coach Bob Larson, uh, Hall of Fame coach, uh, former UCLA coach. Uh, we can go down the list of all the awards, all the athletes, uh, all the organizations that he's been part of, and that'll probably take about 39 of our 40 minutes today. But we wanted to get in, we wanted to have some time to talk to Bob about his long career, his thoughts about uh, running over the last 50 years, 60 years. And uh, without further ado, welcome Bob Larson. Thank you, Tom. Uh, appreciate you having me on. Look forward to it. Well, one of the um, one of the things that uh, I did in preparation for this this California Triathlon Soup podcast was I rewatched uh, City Slickers Can't Stay with Me, and I was fortunate enough to watch that with you about five years ago in Los Angeles um, with your son, and it was a well produced event. And it would be great, um, you know, if you would kind of, if you don't mind, kind of go through what that movie you know, was and did and what that meant to you? Well, Robert Lusitano was one of my runners at, um, he had gone to Monta Vista High School, Grossmont Community College, uh, UCLA, and ran with the Mool Toad. So we knew the background of all these things that had happened, many of the things uh, in my career. And uh, he uh, wanted to do a documentary on it. And I said, oh, no, no one would be interested in that. And uh, I'm not too sure my even my family would be interested in that. And uh, but he persisted and uh, and produced this film. He'd never done a film in his life, uh, but his uh, sister is uh, pretty well known in Hollywood for what she does on the History Channel. And Uncle was a sound man in uh, Hollywood, et cetera. So uh, they got a good writer and really good uh, film crew. And they followed uh, me and around and interviewed uh, many of the guys that... Uh, uh, I coached over the years and uh, lo and behold, it, it turned out uh, one that uh, people really enjoy and find inspiration in and sold out in uh, many theaters across the country and at the Olympic trials in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, so um, I was wrong about the whole thing. I'm, you know, so pleased that Robert went ahead of it in spite of my uh, dis uh, discouraging him. Um, and uh, it's still, I, uh, on um, Amazon now. I think you can get it for free, Amazon.com. It was on iTunes too. I'm not sure uh, how many places you can find it on the internet, but um, it is available there. And uh, if you watch it on a big screen, it still kind of pops out at you because the uh, film crew was excellent and they got great pictures of uh, uh, some of the stuff we were doing up at Mammoth at high altitude and uh, and, and stuff over the years that uh, the highlights, one of the highlights I think a lot of people see is um, if you're a coach or uh, even a parent, you know how when people are young, they are paying attention to you. And when he's interviewing guys in their 50s and 60s now who a few of those instances where they had gone through and ran with the, one of these uh, schools that I coached at or uh, and or with the Hamul Toads and um uh, they remember so much of that and give credit to so many of the things they learned in sports have helped them to um, uh, in the rest of their life. And they refer to it mentally, you know, quite frequently and as a boost to what they're doing. And uh, so those are some great stories. And then um, uh, Robert uh, talks a lot about uh, Meb Kefleski and it actually ends with Meb running uh, Boston uh, when he won in 2013 and, you know, that real emotional uh, year after the bombing and what Meb was thinking while he was running a little bit of, uh, I'm talking in the background too. And um, just watching that again, you know, brings back some wonderful memories. So uh, thanks for mentioning that. And uh, I know Robert will be pleased and he never, I have no financial interest in it. He wasn't trying to make money doing this. He just did it labor of love. And, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, a lot of people find inspiration in it. I was in, um, I was, I had remembered, obviously known, known about you at UCLA and 
that you were Meb's coach. I think, I think, you know, I, I think most people in this space would know that, but the, uh, the background that I enjoyed, I think the most was the, the background on, you know, Grossmont college and the Jamal toads. And I don't think, you know, outside of San Diego, as many people who really aren't hardcore in the space back in the day would, would have known about it. Can, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, Grossmont and the Jamal toads and, how that started. And, and even to this day that that organization continues. Uh, I, I went to school down there. I was injured in uh, high school a little bit and still won the city mile uh, kid off the farm. So in Northern Minnesota, so uh, didn't have any plans Didn't didn't know what I was going to do. My, my high school coach, Raleigh Hope talked me into being a, he, he thought I should be a coach and, uh, mentioned it a few times. And so when I got to college, I think about that. And um, anyway, so I was down there in San Diego and uh, took a, a position with them coaching the team when I graduated. And uh, then I wanted to coach in high school, kind of in honor of my high school coach. And so Monta Vista High School, small school, and um, we won the championships each year. And then on to Grossmont College, where two of the very best coaches in that area were coaching, Ron Bavra. Uh, one of the best I ever worked with. And so I went over there rather than up to the four, back to the four year level and then um, coached there for several years. We won a lot of uh, state championships on defeated teams and broke the national records. And so uh, the second time I was asked to come up to UCLA, uh, work with Jim Bush, I did. He said he was going to retire in a couple of years. So it, when I was at Monta Vista High School, put together a training group. I wanted it to be kind of a fun thing and for them not to take it too seriously. And so I call it the Hamul Athletic Club. But uh, after a couple of years, uh, another group in the area that was running together, kind of similar to us, uh, they called themselves the Toads. And uh, they wanted to get together with us, and we eventually did. And uh, so that's where the Hamul Toad thing came from. But in 1976, we went back to Nationals, and we won and beat the Colorado Club. We had been winning that thing with really low scores and had a lot of named people. And uh, so it upset everything uh, in the running world a little bit. And what were these guys doing? And uh, we were all just locals and uh, we were trained a little bit different than than anybody else in those days. And uh, we were written up in Sports Illustrated and of course, Runner's World and the other magazines and uh, got a lot of attention. So uh, that thing lived on. And I went up to UCLA finally and, um, had track and field coach for uh, several years and had some great teams. And, you know, a lot of those guys ended up being uh, gold medalists in the Olympic games, but it's still a lot of people remember the Hummel toads, uh, especially from Southern California and other places around the country. So Robert did this film kind of featuring the whole toads and the Grossmont college connection, because they were all Grossmont college guys uh, of the uh, scores, except for one. And uh, so it tied it together. And that's what he was really doing with a film to begin with. And then he expanded because uh, he realized some of these other things were a big piece of the story. And then, of course, uh, Meb and what he was doing. So little bits of all of that are in there. And then after that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, film came out. It was being shown back in Boston for a review from critics and writers, et cetera. One of the people that were there was Matt Futterman. He was writing for the Wall Street Journal at that time. And uh, immediately afterwards, he said, oh, I got to do a book on those guys. And um, so he got a lot of information from Robert Lusitana. He uh, interviewed all the old Hamul toads. He interviewed me several times, and we thought it was going to be about the toads. A lot of it ended up being, again, about some of these things that I had done in my career. So it was kind of through that, that he tells the story of a lot of these guys and how they ended up winning in 1976 and other things and how their uh, lives were affected by it in, in a very positive way and in athletics in general. So the book came out about a year ago. Uh, it's a little less than a year ago. It's called Running to the Edge. And uh, Matt Funderburn is now the deputy sports editor for the New York Times. And um, this thing uh, became a bestseller immediately, and it was 
had to go on a second printing with Doubleday fairly quickly. Uh, still available. It was available in, uh, uh, let's see, Costco and uh, Walmart and all the bookstores. And uh, Matt and I did uh, a few uh, 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 presentations in different parts of the country, including New York, when it was first presented. So a lot of fun. Again, I have no financial interest in it, but uh, I mention it because uh, obviously when someone like Matt and then Robert before him put in so much effort into a project that obviously I'm a, a big part of it and you know so grateful that they saw something special in all these things and uh, they, they persisted in putting together something that a lot of people, again, find uh, very interesting and, and, uh, and, and inspirational in, in, in many ways. So uh, that kind of is, wraps up uh, a little bit of the background on those two projects and uh, how it came. And big part of that inspiration were, was the Hamul Toads back there. And that was inspired you know, from the guys running at Grossmont College at the time. And, and you, um, rolled into the training, um, you said the training was being done a little bit differently. Um, and looking back on it now, uh, some of that training is like, well, sure. You know, of course that's the way it is. But, but back in that time, it, it was different. Um, what, what would you say that, how, how would you define how the training was different back then compared to how everybody else was training? Well, I discovered early on, you know, through experimenting with myself, because we were all doing just interval training when I was an athlete. We knew very little about, uh, you know, what we're doing these days. Uh, you know, when we were getting injured, I was getting stress fractures because they had no background. You know, physically I was strong, but uh, and I could run to the point where I'd get a stress fracture. Uh, so I had to rethink or experiment, figure out what I could do. I ran on the sand about three days a week, eight miles each time for a full season to uh, never had any more stress fractures or lower leg problems. But in doing that, running really hard on some of those workouts and experimenting with different things, uh, that the um, hard runs that I was doing was bringing out my endurance and surprisingly speed uh, better than anything else. And I could avoid injuries doing that. And in fact, won a couple of races so easily when I was doing that type of training, uh, just running away from people uh, that um, I, I should have stuck with that. But of course, you're in a training group. We had a good coach for that time and what he knew. But uh, I just was realizing more and more there was another way of doing this. And it's really what we call now tempo running or threshold running. We didn't have those uh, names for it at that point, but uh, we were just running hard. And when I was uh, uh, then started coaching in high school right away, we were running uh, about a four mile tempo run on a regular basis and sometimes longer. And a lot of our road runs were really uh, high quality because they were trying to stay with me and, or I was trying to stay with them. But, you know, the, uh, the uh, competition a little bit with a coach would get pretty intense and you know, no one could beat those guys. And uh, it, actually the high school team, when I got there, had only won one meet each year for uh, the previous two years in cross country and in same in track. And all of a sudden we're the champions. And um, and the last three of the four years I was there, we were actually undefeated. Nobody could um, could touch us. So, uh, you know, I knew I was onto something that we were doing more tempo threshold runs than anybody else. And um, they were really uh, getting us to a level that, uh, and keeping our guys healthy where, uh, you know, the races were sometimes pretty easy for these guys compared to what we were doing in some of these workouts. So we continued that on at Grossmont College. And um, again, we dominated and uh, uh, the highest uh, competition you're in is, invitationals where you run against four-year schools and uh, we easily beat the four-year schools. Uh, I remember early one season, I think we put five guys in front of one of the four-year teams that eventually uh, did well at the nationals at the four-year level. Uh, so again, we were, we had good talent, but beyond that, it was just local guys. And uh, by doing these workouts, um, we were able to dominate uh, again and keep guys healthy. So the last seven years I was there, we were pretty much undefeated. And, uh, 
And uh, I put together, a, uh, along with another coach in San Diego, a training group who went to, uh, took, or not a training group, but a, um, a group of coaches so we could um, uh, expose them to clinics over in Europe. Uh, the reason we did that is we felt uh, European coaches were ahead of us scientifically. And um, we wanted to expose that to our coaches here in the United States. And uh, one of the people we took with us was Jim Bush, who was coaching at UCLA at the time, and Ernie Bullard, who was at San Jose State. He had real good teams. And But our people were not very scientific. And uh, I'd been over in Europe several times and knew that they were because they didn't have the talent we did. So they were working on some of these things. So uh, when we get over, over there again, I'd gone the first time I went in 63, I guess, but this was now in the 70s, took those coaches over there on a clinic tour. And it was the best thing, you know, many of them will tell you to this day, the thing ever, uh, the best thing they ever did. So all the plyometrics, uh, the form drills, the technique drills, the uh, stride mechanics and all that, a lot of that came from uh, what we exposed these coaches to. All of a sudden they knew there was another level of coaching that, you know, a lot of them were just uh, not using or not even aware of at that point. <laughs> Excuse me. So could add that when I was doing some of the things in the 60s, as far as uh, stride mechanics, that we were a little bit ahead of maybe everybody else, too. So, <laughs> excuse me, when I got to UCLA, we continued on that and uh, had a lot of fun with it. And they had never been to the NC2A with cross country and our first team made it. And, uh, you know, we were in the top five of the nationals a few times when we had some really good distance runners and we were emphasizing that a little bit. But to win the NC2As in track and field as head track and field coach, I wasn't giving any scholarships because uh, to distance runners because that's a hard way when you're in Los Angeles to win an NC2A title. And, you know, we had some great sprinters and uh, throwers available and uh, we did win NC2A titles. And uh, as I said, several of uh, those guys off of one of those teams, we had four, four guys get Olympic medals. Uh, so we dominated there too. And, uh, very fortunate to have these great teams. And I had some great assistant coaches, especially led by John Smith and Art Venegas, sprints and uh, throws. Um, so again, at that level, we had a lot of fun too. And then I retired a little bit early, put together the, along with Joe Vigil, I talked into joining us and we put together the Mammoth Track Club to take advantage of high altitude so we could catch up with the uh, best runners in the world um, who were, uh, training at altitude in those days. So that kind of a summary of some of these things that we've been doing over the last several years. It's remarkable, the um, the phases. And so when you were at UCLA, when you took over for uh, Coach Bush, um, you had guys like Danny Everett, Steve Lewis, um, some of the other, uh, Kevin Young, who else? Some of the other guys that uh, uh, obviously gold medalists um, who were some of the, the names and some of your memories, like maybe some of the best memories you had at UCLA uh, when you were coaching there so successfully? Well, the, you know, starting with some of the distance runners right away, we had guys like that I'd taken to Europe with me when I, we were at uh, Grossmont College. And uh, Dave Daniels, for instance, ran 8 uh, 28 in the steeplechase and uh, without uh, alternating. Uh, if he would alternate, he probably would have made the Olympic team. Um, uh, oh, other guys that, you know, uh, ran really fast times. And in those days, and even at Grossmont College, we had guys running 210 in the marathon and they weren't marathoners. Kirk Pfeffer at Grossmont was a marathoner and he ran 217 as a freshman, 18 years old, world junior record for a long time. Uh, and Ed Mendoza made the Olympic team in 10,000 meters, and he ran 210 in the marathon later. Uh, and at UCLA, we had guys that ran uh, 210 uh, and under 215, 1,500 meter guys. And uh, so when uh, you know I retired from UCLA, I just thought, uh, gee, we can do this thing. No one was running faster than about 213. It was hardly any Americans were going under 215 in those days. So um, 2000 was the year we had one guy and one girl running in uh, 
uh, the Olympic Games because the others weren't qualified time wise, uh, you know, after on sorting everything at the uh, trial. So I uh, knew that area was ripe for uh, help and across the board, we weren't getting even our guys into the finals of the uh, distance uh, races. So uh, when uh, Meb came along and he thought he was a 1500 meter runner, I said, no, I think it's going to be a longer distance and you're, the further, the better. And uh, eventually we got him, uh, I wasn't pushing him, but he came to realize that maybe the marathon would be a, a good distance. So when we were talking about the potential, I said, you know, these guys back in the 60s, or well, especially 70s and 80s, were running 210 in our program. Think of what a 210 would do for you, and you're as talented as they are. And uh, so that kind of piqued his curiosity and, you know, kind of led to you know, putting together the Mammoth Track Club and, and getting other really good runners together so we could support a lot of uh, runners over the years. But harking back to the UCLA days, you mentioned some of them. Kevin Young still has the intermediate world record and only guy other, ever to go under 47 in the intermediates. And a lot of other guys, some of them you mentioned, and Mike Marsh almost broke the world record, the 200 and missed by two hundredths of a second. And the uh, Barcelona Olympic Games also. And uh, let's see some of the other guys uh, that were great runners uh the guy that does the commentary for sprints right now and he's really good at it at an international level out of bolden uh he got olympic medals won world championships and 100 and 200 set the collegiate 100 and 200 uh, record and all these guys were very very dominant uh uh you know when they were at ucla and, and on and they had a great uh post-collegiate career and Thinking of others in the throws with uh, Art Venegas, great coach. And uh, he had, uh, uh, let's see, uh, comes to mind. Uh, I'll think of his name in a minute. He's got a training group over there in uh, Phoenix right now doing a great job. I have to come back, uh, think of uh, who that is in a minute. Um, at a, I'm 104 now, Tom, so I can't remember these names quite as good as I used to be able to do. Uh, oh, Jonathan Ogden, one of the top linemen in the NFL, highest paid and uh, yeah. made it uh, several times as a uh, all-star with the NFL. He retired a couple of years ago. He's with the Ravens, uh, but he was. Jo uh, Jonathan Ogden was the uh, number one draft pick in 1996. Well, number one Raven, first round, number four draft pick for the Ravens. Um, and I'm a, I'm a huge Ravens fan. So, uh, <laughs> he, I, I'll put a little trivia in here for everybody listening. Um, the first two, those were the first picks of the Ravens franchise. And in the first round, they picked two picks. One was Jonathan Ogden, I think at the fourth pick. And the second pick in the first round was Ray Lewis at the 26th pick. And both wow. of them are in the hall of fame. So Jonathan, they, they started Jonathan was almost a straight A a student in uh, back there in the East Coast, came all the way out to UCLA, play football and, and throw the shot put. He won the NC2A indoor shot. Uh, he was 6'10", I think, at least 6'8", maybe 6'8". Six, six, that sounds about right. Yeah. And um, 300, a little over 300, but when he was in shape, 300. But if you saw him on the other side of the field, you thought he was just a normal sized guy because he's perfectly proportioned, no fat, heck of an athlete, really good guy. And uh, anyway, he was, you know, one of the guys on that team. And, uh, you know, so fortunate to have people like that. They're just outstanding people as well as uh, great athletes. But uh, yeah, Jonathan stands out. And uh, well, we were having there, a, there were so many a really good ones during that uh, that time period. A couple of Ravens fans, We were, the other day we were talking about our favorite all-time Ravens, you know, uh, that franchise has been around, this is the 24th, 25th year, and uh, Jonathan Ogden was the first um, and uh, and favorite, my favorite. So I had a chance to meet him a few years ago at uh, one of the UCLA golf events and um, class act all the way around. So that's that's fantastic. Anytime we could talk about the Ravens. <laughs> um, when, when do you, when, did, let me ask you a question. When did you decide or what was the impetus to go to altitude? 
was it something you had seen somewhere else or when, when was that? Um, let me think back on that, why I wanted to do that. When I graduated from college, I was interested in the science of the sport, but they didn't have any really good postgraduate. There was only one school, I think it was Indiana maybe, with Doc Consulman that had uh, sports medicine and, you know, just the science aspect to it. And that's one of the reasons we went to Europe to with our coaches later in the six, 70s. We were still behind in all that. But, you know, I was aware reading – over the years that there had to be something about altitude that was beneficial. And uh, we would train at altitude for a week or so before the start of the season. When I was at UCLA, been up at uh, in the Sierras every year with our uh, cross country teams, even back in high school, we'd go up backpacking. You realized how hard it was to breathe when you got up a road much above 7,000 feet and we'd get up to 10,000 feet and we'd be running on the trails and I'd be running with them. And you just put those things together and figure, ah, uh, if you, your body does adapt to it after a few days, you felt, well, gee, uh, when we get down to sea level, of course we weren't at altitude long enough for it to help us a lot, but there's gotta be some things there. So paying attention to the science of it, realizing that over a period of time, uh, this might be very beneficial if you use it uh, intelligently. So about 99, uh, 1999, about the time I was ready to uh, retire, which I did in 2000, is that um, they put on a clinic at the U.S. Uh, annual uh, track and field uh, staff an annual meeting. It was in Los Angeles and uh, they were presenting information about training at altitude. And I had already talked to a couple of kids that had been involved in that. They were using uh, Salt Lake City and uh, uh, Park City. So they were doing, uh, uh, seeing what they could do, staying at a certain uh, level and uh, coming down to train at a little lower level, going back up and stuff like this, figuring out how long it would take. So uh, listened to that, talked to him a little bit more and decided that's what we had to do. Uh, I was going to put together a training group anyway, similar to Hamul Toads. Uh, <clears throat> but then, uh, you know, after hearing that and even before that, I was uh, aware of what altitude, some of the potential of it was and how many people in the world were training at altitude and be doing it successfully. Again, we were behind in that area in the United States, way behind. Uh, and at the same time as I was going into retirement, uh, I realized, you know, Joe V Hill had retired. He had been at Adam state for years, had a tremendous program in NEIA, uh, division two, they dominated cross country at that level for years and won many championships. And, uh, so they were at the perfect altitude, 7,500 feet. Well, Mammoth Lakes is the same. And so talked to Joe, said, come on out. Uh, we can train athletes at the Olympic Training Center in uh, San Diego, and then uh, we could set up something at Mammoth Lakes, uh, and uh, we'll see what, what we can do. And, and uh, Joe, too, was enthusiastic about this. He was uh, advising several athletes at that time, including Dina Castor, and, of course, I had met Kip Flesge and others, and so we put all that together. But that was kind of the trigger for me was 99 when I was hearing what kind of results they thought, you, you, you know, that they were getting physiologically by being at altitude for a longer period of time than just a week or two. And and so, you know, what part of our, our, our these days, like we, we have athletes who are just, you know, regular regular, you know, middle pack or age group athletes. And the next thing you know, they, they have a race and it's going to be at altitude. It's going to be in Colorado or it's going to be in Utah. And the question always comes back. Um, what's the proper training to prepare for a race at altitude? If I don't live at altitude, okay. um, any thoughts about that? Well, they, <clears throat> the people that do this regularly they have always felt that you come in at the last minute, wait as long as you can. And, and doing this myself, going to altitude, um, it'd be better to race shortly after you get to altitude, maybe the next day. 
um, there's kind of a lag after that where you're losing some of uh, uh, the, not advantage, but at least the level that you're at when you get there. So um, I think that works pretty well. Now, if you have time and you can go to altitude three weeks in advance uh, or as least a week, uh, three weeks would be ideal, uh, then you've got a real advantage. Like our people are training at Mammoth at 7,500 feet when they go to Albuquerque for an indoor meet, which they've had there, you know, uh, over the years, they're coming down in altitude. I mean, what advantage those people have, and that would be ideal. Uh, but if you just have to go straight from sea level to altitude, I would say get your, your race in uh, shortly after you get there. You all, you, um, you always have to think of how is the people that you're working with going to react to traveling. If they're going through time zones, you got that factor too. Uh, some people can go through time zones and race right away, but others have to have a few days recovery. So there's a lot of individual uh, uh, adaptation to change in altitude and change in, in time zones and just traveling that some people do well. Dina Castor and uh, Meb Keflesgi were two of the best at being able to go to the other side of the country and run really well right away. Uh, Johnny Gray, who had the American record in the 800 until last summer, could go to Europe, get off the plane and, and race. In fact, he was better then than sometimes later after he'd been in Europe for a while. So there's a whole bunch of factors, but hopefully that would help. Uh, it, do, it does. It, it, go ahead. Yeah. No, it does indeed. It does indeed. Thank you. Uh, um, can we go back for a minute? Uh, of course. We were talking about, you know, why we felt maybe we were a little ahead in some training. You know, this was way back again in the 60s and 70s uh, and early 80s. But uh, I mentioned what we were doing was threshold training. Now, everybody was doing some threshold training. In fact, a lot of guys were doing very high mileage. But we experimented with all types of workouts because I was working with the Hamul Toads and with the – college team some were doing were were helping on the Hamul toads too but i could divide the groups up into uh, different training groups so if the guys some of the guys i said if we want to do interval training uh more frequently we'll do that some of you guys want to do higher mileage we had guys doing 175 a week uh kirk pfeffer ended up doing some 200 mile weeks uh, so we had both extremes and, you know, so I found out a lot about um, what I thought <clears throat> would work for the majority of guys. And then you have to change it for individuals. But part of that was you didn't have to run a lot of mileage if there was real good quality in those road runs that you were doing. In other words, threshold. Now, some experts have said, well, you need a 20 minute threshold run. Well, we found that for elite athletes, it should be quite a bit further than that. And with Meb, before he got the medal in Athens, and uh, he had a real shot at the gold. He finished, and he he was he was probably the still had more energy along with Dina when she got her medal too than maybe anybody else that finished. So we knew that what we're doing that type of training with long threshold runs at altitude. Um, were, were really productive and harking all the way back to the sixties and seventies. That's exactly what we were doing. And eventually over the years, I found that, uh, you know, the Kenyans weren't running all that fast in those days. Once in a while, a guy would come over and be a good 1500 meter runner, but he'd be doing that mainly off of just great raw ability, Kano, for instance. But then you found they started coming on in the longer distances and what they were doing were out and back runs and they were going out slow and coming back really fast. They're threshold runs and they were doing them multiple times a week, just like we've been doing at Monta Vista High School and Grossmont College. And uh, so, you know, the, the, uh, the value of those runs, uh, because you can, uh, you can increase your threshold easier probably than anything else. And uh, 
a lot of coaches and athletes are attracted to getting on interval early in uh, a, a season because it's like throwing uh, gas on a fire. You get results immediately with, uh, if you don't break down, you get a, results with interval training so quickly. But if you wait and put your uh, uh, level of fitness at a higher level before you, you start your interval training. If you run good mileage and get the aerobic base up, then do the threshold training and delay the interval training until you can maintain threshold more than just four miles, maybe go eight miles, 10 miles, uh, and you can maintain it. Now you're ready for interval training and now when you lay on an interval level you get much more ben benefit out of it if you're trying to then if you're trying to do intervals off of not much of a base or any threshold training and that's what we were doing and a lot of guys were were using multiple interval workouts a week uh, relying on that and some road runs we were relying more on uh, getting really fit the threshold training to get really strong, we could just go on the track and do a few 200s a couple times and our guys could run races off of that and sometimes get uh, even PRs over what they had done previously uh, without hardly inter interval training. So it was easy to peak at the end of the year because they would just keep training like that. And by the time they got to the end of the year, they were still healthy. Now we could add interval training back off on their, uh, the length of the thresholds back off on the volume and uh, they're virtually unbeatable, uh, you know, doing that stuff. So uh, that's why, you know, looking back, I realized uh, not knowing what everybody else was doing, but realizing later when I realized that it was somewhat of an advantage and we had good talent obviously and guys willing to work really hard and they were tough in 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 um, races bob you've got you got me so fired up I'm, i've got like the shoes laced up and right after this i'm i'm heading out i mean this is uh i'm pretty fired um what what a couple quick questions on that what kind of volume um, were, are, are these obviously elite athletes what kind of volume are, are the weekly volume were they averaging I have to preface that by saying that, you know, like Ed Mendoza, who made it to the Olympic team in the 10,000 meter in 76, and then later ran 210 in the marathon, I wouldn't let him run more than 50 miles a week. This is at Grossmont College, community college. And uh, some of the guys there were running 100 miles a week, and he would beat them at the end of the year. Uh, the reason I wouldn't let him run uh, more than 50 is he had stress fractures in high school. Uh, so I didn't want him, he never had a stress fracture at Grossmont College. So, uh, you know, you suit it to the person. And I sit down with the athletes and try to find the ideal uh, mileage volume for them at that particular time. And that'll change from year to year, usually will go up. But if you looked at back in that time period, uh, probably guys were doing more mileage than uh, when in the nineties was kind of a lost period of time for distance runners in the United States. Uh, there was uh, a thought from the scientific community that it had to be all uh, high intensity and the volume wasn't really necessary. You got to have both. Uh, but that reasoning kind of prevailed. So all of a sudden you had a lot of people that uh, let's say in high school, could run 410 in the mile, uh, but they couldn't break nine minutes for two miles. So you knew they weren't, if they're a 410 miler in high school, they're very uh, talented, but they couldn't break nine. And previous to that, guys are running 840s and 850s uh, and running really fast in the mile. Well, they were, they were interval trained rather than trained with the background and the mileage, et cetera. Swimming went through the same thing. All of a sudden, swimmers didn't have the best sprint swimmers in the world because their volume was reduced thinking that physiologists, not all of them, but a lot of them were preaching. It's got, you don't need the volume. You just need the intensity. Uh, now we're much wiser in these things where we're getting a balance again. And, you know, 
experimenting with all this, I still emphasize that it should be balanced training. It can't be all distance or all sprints. It's a little bit every, in between, and it depends on that, that individual. Well, when you get to know that individual, you get to you get to to kind of find with him working with him or women. I've worked with women too. What's the ideal uh, mileage after you've been training? Maybe for about four to six weeks, you should find your sweet spot. Uh, at first, there's some drudgery involved in it because your body gets sore and you're tired and it's it's really hard. But you come out of that and now you kind of get to a sweet spot where you're feeling pretty good all the time. You're looking forward to those runs. And, um, and then you kind of judge that. Well, while you're getting to that sweet spot or f- trying to figure it out, you have to experiment. You go on some long runs, some shorter, faster runs, uh, twice a day stuff at Mendoza, for instance, uh, community college, never let him run twice a day. And, uh, cause of injury factor. And, but at the end of the year, he would be going faster and faster in the threshold runs. Things I knew won't work are low mileage and no intensity. We know that isn't going to get you there. That that sounds kind of like what what I do. Yeah, low <laughs> low mileage, and it's very nice, Bob. It's it's very nice to do it that way. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but you know that's where coaching comes in, and that's where a, a person who once gets this stuff down, like Meb, his last few years probably didn't need coaching. I mean, it was fun to work with him. And if when he got injured or something, and then we were in the swimming pool and doing those workouts and all of that stuff, then, it, or when it's uh, snowing up at mammoth and you got to get to your workouts and get all that done is it's, it's good to have support. But uh, a lot of this stuff, uh, it, it isn't real complicated once uh, once someone knows the principle of it, the fun of it is trying to work out what works best for yourself. Uh, and in a college high school program, you, you have less wiggle room, but usually you have the option of how much extra mileage you're going to run, you know, in the second run a day or in the morning or whatever you're going to do it. Uh, and that's the fun part of it. And that's the fun part of being a coach is trying to figure all these things out because it isn't one standard way of doing it. And uh, and, I've, you know, I've been very fortunate to have some great athletes. By the way, with the book, uh, Running to the Edge, uh, again, Futterman's book, he gives me way too much credit for influence on distance running. But what I'm grateful for is uh, working with people like uh, <clears throat> Joe Vihul, just outstanding. And he has a physiology background and uh, altitude background. I mean, he and I working together, that that was just a dream. Uh, and any, a lot of other people that I wish I had time to give credit to, uh, you know, coming up with a book, a lot of the things that I arrived at that were so helpful for us, I got a lot of those ideas a little bit from other people. And then you have good athletes and you try different things out and, and they're willing to, to try them, uh, uh, different ways of doing these things. And that eventually evolved to where you know, we had those championship type of teams. Well, it's the perfect um, segue to our last, last time um, or last, you know, a couple minutes together. Um, We'll not get, let you get off of the podcast without um, a couple different, you know, mentioning a couple different things. One is when we met last time, you had mentioned uh, a phrase that, that I, I use and, and, and we use is it's hard by the yard, but uh, a cinch, cinch by the inch. And we use that. And then the second part, and then, then I, I want to turn over the last part to you and, and, and you can talk about it is, you know, the importance that you have um, on group training, um, the concept of where you are uh, relative now isn't, isn't necessarily, you know, what, what is your destiny? And then in terms of training when you're, you know, in racing, when you're comfortably uncomfortable, those are themes that have been part of your you know, background and, and I'd love you to address, you know, one or any and all in, in sort of our, our wrap up. You have to remind me, I tend to get off uh, the subject here as we talk, because it reminds me of something else sure. that I'm, you know, remember from the past. Us old guys uh, are prone to that. So uh, the first one, as far as uh, 
hard by the yard, e- easy by the inch. Ron Vaver, who I coached with at Grossmont College, he talked me into coming working with him up there. Got to give credit. He probably found it someplace else, but he that was one of his favorite savings, and it's been mine too. But uh, let's give him that credit. And uh, the next question, group training. Uh, that's why we put together the Mool Toads. Uh, to begin with, is that we got these guys together, and uh, that made a huge difference. Uh, you know, to get out there, and a lot of times in those days, th- some of these, several of these guys were doing long runs in the morning and long runs at night. To do that every day and all, all by yourself, Kirk Pfeffer could certainly do that. He could pound out an eight mile and come back another eight mile or two 10 mile tempos in a, in, in a week. But then he'd start dragging. And, uh, you know, I'd set him down. I didn't want him to go over a hundred miles a week. Again, this was a kid that wanted to be a marathoner and he was running a hundred miles in high school. So I didn't want him going any more than that. And he'd get cranky. And, and then we'd talk about what his mileage was. I said, Kirk, you're way over a hundred for this week. We got to pull this back. But he, you put guys together with a Kirk Pfeffer. You put guys together with some of these other people I coached. And they're going to get better real quickly because if you go out on an eight mile run in the morning and you're running with your teammates, uh, it's just like the Kenyans running to school or the Ethiopians running to school. When Grover Selassie was running 10,000 meters to school and 10,000 meters home, do you think he was jogging every day? Don't you think that some of the guys in the surrounding villages that, would run along with him, they wouldn't start racing. They run threshold. It's just a natural thing for you to run threshold. You're going to say, you know, I'm going to get to school before this guy does. And also a lot of times you're running late. You're going to run a little bit faster. That's the basis of a lot of the training we were doing. It's that simple is it's a fun thing to do to run with your buddies and run pretty doggone hard. And, uh, it's not bad. You can't, as a coach, you can't let them race all the time. You don't want to make it to the end of the season, but that's how you build this thing is get those guys, get the build an atmosphere where the guys love going out on the roads and, and pushing the pace and, uh, and then just cautioning them. I'd run out the first few miles with them, hold them down, then tell them where we we're going to run, let them take off they'd be spread out like you are in a race, but there'd be four or five guys up front. They're running some five minute mile pace. They're running an eight mile uh, tempo run, but they're not all out. And, uh, and then I cut across so I can kind of coach them say, okay, that's a little bit too much. Pull it back a little bit. Or some of the guys in the back, just encouraging them, you know, try to get a little bit closer and stuff like that. That really works. And, um, that that's group training and, uh, Joe V. Hill and I had that going on up at Mammoth. And then with uh, uh, Terrence Mellon, who uh, was uh, with us up there and uh, took uh, Joe's spot. And uh, we continued on that and just had a heck of a, uh, a good experience with uh, doing that at altitude, at, uh, uh, that Mammoth group for a long time. Same training we were doing, Joe, and pretty much the same what he was doing at altitude. I was doing it in, in, in uh, San Diego. And and uh, continued on. And now you see more and more of the groups uh, doing that same thing, trying to get the groups running at a higher, higher level. Now you had another question. And also I wanted to add something. You have a lot of guys, I think that uh, obviously that are triathletes, a lot of uh, Meb's training in his later years, we were doing cross training. So his afternoon run, rather than being a run, he get on a bicycle and go pretty hard or get on a lip to go the one with the wheels. And, uh, so he would cut down on stress on his body for the second run of the uh, day. And that worked really well in keeping him healthy. The last month when we were at altitude, you don't have to run as fast when you're at altitude too, to get your heart rate up. So he could run his afternoon runs four five, six miles, uh, and run it rather than doing the cross training. But, I think that extended his career. Remember, he was on the Olympic team in the marathon in uh, Rio. He's he's age 41. 
The other thing he did was cut back, uh, like Kirk Pfeffer and some of these guys did who were still winning marathons when they were in their 40s, is that uh, cut back the interval training to just one day a week. We did that with Meb in, when he came back from Athens. So we never do more than one day a week of interval training. But we still had quality in the workouts because of what we were doing on the roads. And we had, you know, good long runs, too. But uh, uh, a little bit later, and he kind of came up with uh, what we had done earlier, too. And I think uh, Joan Bonoy did this and some other runners that extended their careers is go on a nine day schedule rather than a seven day schedule. So on a nine day schedule, it would be uh, two sets of three, three sets of three days So on those uh, say the first segment would be uh, road run, road run, uh, interval training, then road run, road run, uh, tempo run, then road run, road run, long run, and then you repeat it. And for Meb, uh, you know, he, he would make up his mind. You know, we were training much together, but sometimes on his own too, or with other people we had that would help him pace him on a bicycle that uh, – if that particular day didn't feel right for interval training, he'd do the threshold run or the, a long run or just do another fairly easy run on the roads. Now, all those road runs that he's doing, two and then an intense workout, two more road runs, those road runs for Meb were not threshold, those recovery days, but they're still higher level than a lot of guys do on those quote, recovery days. Uh, when he was in really good shape, his recovery run days would maybe start at seven and get down to maybe five thirty or five forty five pace. Uh, so you got to kind of factor that in. Uh, he wasn't running that fast his last few years, but still getting really good results on the road, including winning New York in two thousand nine when he was already uh, kind of old for people. Uh, winning major races like that. And then, of course, Boston, when they let him go because they didn't think he still had that in him and he ran 208.30 uh, and, uh, you know, not doing it on, on a lot of mileage or a lot of, in, of, of uh, intense training, uh, especially on interval training. Uh, so that stuff really worked for him. But my uh, message is those of... Uh, people you have that are wondering how much they're getting out of a bike or uh, uh, swimming. And we've had Meb in the pool for long, long periods of time, at least a month, at least three times in his career running in the water. So again, cross training, similar, somewhat similar to what triathletes do. I think overall it made him stronger than just being doing running all the time. So I think you guys have some advantages and, just adjust it as you get older. And we've seen young athletes come out of triathlon and be great runners right away. Uh, so, um, you know, more, more power to you guys, and we should do more testing with what you guys are doing and what we could carry into distance running at get people at a higher, higher level without injuring them. Well, Bob, I have to tell you, um, you know, we've done this for a few years and uh, we had a group of us, you know, wanted to, we were putting out our list this year of, of who we would like to, to have as, as a guest. And this one is pretty special. And our, our uh, whole group uh, very much appreciates it. Um, this has been uh, fantastic uh, to spend, you know, 50, 55 minutes uh, with uh, Hall of Fame legend, legendary coach um, Bob Larson, and it means a lot. And it was fantastic. And one of the things we'll do as part of this podcast is we're going to be uh, offering a few free editions of the Running to the Edge with um, with Matt Futterman uh, as um, as a giveaway items for for some of the folks that listen to the podcast. So. Um, if you have anything else, um, I, I will say this, every one of the main comments is going to come is you are maybe around 80 years old and your ability to go into names and to remember all these names is something that uh, folks that are half your age uh, would be proud to have. 
Well, thank you so much. I've enjoyed it. And I remember the name, John Godina was our uh, thrower that I was trying to come up with. Uh, won worlds in shot, discus, and uh, medals in the Olympic Games, too. And uh, anyway, so many others uh, uh, I've left off of, you know, those years and guys that did some wonderful things. And for you to allow me to reminisce a little bit and uh, have some fun with it. And I remember those times. Uh, uh, thank you uh, so much. And uh, I have great respect for uh, you guys that, that train, regardless of the level of results you're getting, you're doing something very positive with your life. And, and it's not just you, but the example of being out in the community and working out and doing things. And especially when you do it later in life, I still jog and, uh, you know, I, I think that that's a good uh, example for our, uh, my grandsons, but for people that watch you too. And uh, there's a good message, I think, for everybody. We're in a terrific sport. And, uh, you know, I'm always grateful that, uh, that I'm still a part of this. This has been uh, a bit of time with Bob Larson. And again, thank you so much for your time.